Welcome to All About APIs. On this podcast, you'll hear from seasoned API practitioners, product leaders, and architects on what it takes to successfully design, launch, and maintain APIs that unlock new growth opportunities. So James, thank you so much for joining. Maybe if you could start off with a quick introduction of yourself, I think you're best positioned to do that. And uh, we'll kick things off for, with our first question. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so I'm the founder of a, a small boutique consulting company called Launch Any. Uh, we focus on helping organizations to uh, establish, grow, and mature their API programs. So that involves everything from helping teams uh, to uh, design an API, you know, coaching them through the process to establishing the processes for large enterprises as well as software as a service companies. So uh, my background is in software development and architecture. So I uh, built software, built APIs in the past. I've been in the industry for, for almost 25 years now. And so now I'm, I'm looking uh, at, you know, with this book, helping teams at a greater scale than I have before, where, you know, in the past, I've been traveling around the globe, helping with training, uh, coaching uh, different teams. Now this book is kind of capturing a lot of the details that I've learned, the insights I've learned from others and things that I've presented in workshops into print form. So I'm excited to, to talk a bit about it today. Awesome. Thank you. And in our own experience, we've been work we've worked together on a couple of things, a couple of white papers and blog posts before, and it's been always very insightful around, you know, the world of API design and how that sort of fits in. How do you start thinking about some of these aspects, how do you think, start thinking about it right at the beginning, in fact, as opposed to thinking it, thinking about it afterwards and, you know, where do you start and get going? So without further ado, let us get started. I think we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So I'm going to kick things off right at the very beginning. So of course, we're talking about API first products or a being API first or, you know, API first businesses. And, and, and there's an API first concept that's come up quite a bit. I'm quite curious, how do you perceive that? How would you define something like API first? What does that actually mean for someone who's getting started in this world? Uh, for me, it's, it's really about how you approach uh, the, the problem and the solution. Do we see our problems and solutions that we deliver as digital assets, digital capabilities, whether they're APIs or events or, or any other kind of digital asset that we're exposing? Do we start there first and then start to solution out from there so that the way that people interact with our product or our organization, uh, it, it can be automated or can be integrated in new and exciting ways rather than being fully dependent on the organization to deliver the full end-to-end -end solution? Uh, that, right. that, that's where I kind of start from a fundamentals perspective. Now, moving on from there, obviously, you, you talk about... Um thinking about value essentially that you know what what is it the, what is the objective of, of building this now when someone is getting started with their api strategy or api journey where do they get started like i know this is a very open general kind of question but like what would you say is the step one is it something like do you, do you start off with personas do you start off with business requirements do you start off with capabilities what's what sort of the, the starting point of creating an api strategy uh, I, I would say there's kind of two major paths that I recommend depending on who you are and what you're trying to do. Is your organization or your large enterprise? If that's the case, then it's starting with the strategy. What are the desired uh, goals, outcomes, and and you know a, a purpose uh, that you have for your API strategy? What are you trying to to get out of it, and how are you supporting the marketplace? through that strategy. If you're uh, a startup or a software as a service that's been around for 10, 20 years, and you're looking at trying to establish a, a better foothold in the API space with, with your product by building an API around it, then I would start to look at the, the marketplace and understand uh, what are people trying to do and, and then start to identify those personas and, and start from that perspective. So it really depends on, on who you are. I work with a lot of enterprises and occasionally with a software as a service uh, organization. And I've been involved with both. I've co-founded SaaS companies before. I've been interim CTOs for software as a service companies before. So I've, I've experienced both sides of that. And each one has a different set of problems and different um, concerns that they, they have to think about. So your API strategy really needs to think ultimately about what's the goal, what are the outcomes, and then who are you serving? And for some, it might be a partnership or, you know, different kinds of people in your supply chain. 
uh, for an enterprise, it might be a combination of a partners, customers, uh, you know, third party uh, integrations that you need to be able to support either people coming to you and integrating or, or vice versa. So looking at that and understanding that is absolutely essential. That helps to frame what we do and focus what we do so that we don't spend a lot of time building APIs that are unnecessary and focus instead on the APIs that are going to really deliver that value. And that's that's why the subtitle of the book is is about delivering value with APIs and microservices. Uh, so right. starting starting there is really, really important. Okay, awesome. You you touched upon something very interesting there, where you know you obviously are looking at goals, outcomes, and audiences, but also equally when you're building out your APIs, not for, from the consumption perspective, but also, or maybe just it is for the consumption perspective. But when you're building out these APIs, how do you think about personas? How do you think about the different people who will be interacting with this with these APIs, from you know product owners to you know CEOs to your developers, and how? How do you start thinking from, from that perspective? How do you think about personas in this case? I, I start with outcomes. So I start with what, what, what are we trying to deliver? Um, I, in the book and in any of the teaching that I've done over the years and even some of the articles I've posted on, on Tyke is I have um, really encouraged people to think about what's the job to be done. So what are the things that are being done? And then how can we deliver an API to help that either in automate the work or to empower the uh, participants, the end users, those different personas that are going to be involved in performing those jobs to you know, do that either from mobile, web, or any kind of, of channel that, that you might need to offer to support that. So that, that's the first and foremost thing. So I start with those jobs to be done or the outcomes. And for you know, established companies, that means stepping back away from the, 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 the web apps, the mobile apps, the internal apps that you have, and to start thinking about how are we interacting with the marketplace? Who are we interacting right. with? What do they need to do? And then having discussions with them. So it's bringing in those concepts of, of product management, product ownership, lean startup methodologies, bringing those to bear and say, you know, do I know enough about my target audience? Have I asked them sufficient questions to gain insights into what I need to do? And from there, you may identify multiple personas, and then you may go back to those personas and, and dig in some more, some more feedback. And it becomes you know, kind of an iterative process until you gain enough insight to know, uh, yeah, I could put an API over everything, but I need to prioritize this work. So how am I going to prioritize it? Let's talk and see what are people doing today that's, that's repetitive, that we can uh, remove, how can we empower them to get access to their data or to enable them to work with us as a product or an organization from their own systems. Right. Um, I'm seeing more and more, you know, self-managed systems. People want to build their own portals and then consume APIs from all their partners and tie things together to build the workflows they want. And low code right. is, is starting to make that even more a reality because now we can kind of stitch things together, you know, pretty quickly and build solutions. And it may not just be one org to one org or one org to one product. It could be right. a variety of different ways. So stepping back, looking at those outcomes, looking at those jobs to be done, really understanding it and then being able to prioritize from there. That helps us focus in on what APIs we need to, to deliver first and foremost. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I, th I think you touched on a very good point where, you know, you talk about how do you, again, you think about the consumption of APIs as well. So you're stitching things together, of course, and you're, you're pro providing and presenting that to the world in a way or, or to your target audience, essentially, so that it's it's consumable. At the end of the day, whether the audience is internal or external, the idea is to make those APIs available and whatever information that is behind those APIs essentially available as well. So that's where I think where, you know, some something like an API gateway or an API management platform, which is where we sort of come in, we started off with that concept as well, where, you know, we want to make this as available, as easy to consume as possible, but at the same time, almost have this as an ab abstraction layer and on top of you know, your microservices or the service that you're building so that you focus on the business logic, build out that, that, that logic that you need in order to service those target audiences where we will have this abstracted layer or, which will take care of your API security, will take care of you know, stitching together information perhaps uh, as we are doing now as well. So Definitely, definitely, some of these different components fit in really, really well, and you can see, you can start seeing um, the the motivation behind using some of these different elements. One other thing that I'm going to go in here is you obviously talk about value quite a lot. One thing that a lot of people struggle with is how do you quantify value? 
And that is where, you know, you talk about metrics. So what are, you know, how do you start thinking about metrics of success? Uh, so that goes back to the outcomes. If, if we have done our proper due diligence and we understand not only the personas, but what the jobs to be done are, then we can start to have metrics to determine how successful are those personas in using our API. So the metrics, you know, a lot of metrics that are common for people that are providing an API are like how many requests that I have, you know, how many error responses that I have to send back, what kind of infrastructure issues I might have, or, or, or you know, how, how are my consumers maybe misunderstanding how to use an API and we're sending back error status codes and so we need to beef up our documentation, those kinds of things. Those are all valuable. But in the right. end, your API is delivering value to a particular value chain or part of a value chain. It's going to be partners, it's going to be customers, it's going to be someone. So nice. a lot of organizations track that based on transactions, um, whether it's you know some, some purchase being done or some sort of outcome or result being produced. So that's, that's um, you know, one of the most important. Uh, the other thing is to kind of take a bit of a marketing, you know, put your ma marketing hat on and think about funnels. In marketing, we talk about funnels, how, you know, who's at the top, who's kind of interested in, you know, our product, our service. And then we kind of see how many people uh, will kind of come through the funnel and become a customer or engage with us in some way that's meaningful, delivers value to them and delivers value to the business. So the value to the business might be a relationship. It might be a subscription. It, you know, it may be... Um, taking an existing customer and getting them to integrate with our API, because oftentimes once we've integrated with an API, we're less resistant to change. We therefore can, as the provider, the, the organizations providing the API, reduce customer churn because now we have more integrations and it's more costly for that person to make the switch. So as long as we're listening and, and being attentive to our our target audience is paying for access to our API or paying for a SaaS subscription and getting the API for free or, you know, whatever that model is, that value is ensuring that they can continue to do the same things they've always done and continue to do more and interesting things for them. Uh, so there's value on the, the provider side, there's value on the customers or consumer side, and it's understanding that and setting up metrics that determine that. And all of that oftentimes is driven by outcomes. Are we helping people get things done and either doing it in an automated way or making their life easier by offering APIs that empower them to do things from their own web apps by integrating with our own API or from our own solutions that we offer that utilize those APIs underneath the covers? Got it. Okay. That's a great way to think about it. Um... Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next section. <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping an eye out of the time, but it's like I could probably, we can probably have this conversation for at least two to three hours easy. But okay, we'll, we'll move on to keep things, keep things short. And of course, everyone who's listening, do you, if you have questions, do feel free to ask those as we go along. Uh, moving on to the next segment of this, which is essentially, I guess, the, the title of the book almost, where we talk about API design. So what are sort of, how do you start thinking about? So almost you've, you've got your API strategy here. And of course, maybe API design, you, you think about it from a strategic perspective as well, but let's start about the actual implementation side of things. When we start moving into that direction, how do you start thinking about API design? What are some of the key elements of it? What are the key challenges with it? Um, let's talk about those aspects. Uh, I, I think it's oftentimes misunderstood that APIs are strictly uh, just a developer concern or a technology solution. Uh, we're not selecting Node or Java and Spring Framework or PHP and all, you know, we're not making technical decisions about a helper library or a library we're going to import in to make our job a little bit easier. We're making decisions that are not only going to have an impact on ourselves and our, uh, uh, you know, our organization, but we're making an impact on all sorts of other organizations. And so it's important to recognize that API design is a collaborative effort we have to consider the fact that this isn't just something that we push in the corner and, and, and write code and a design kind of emerges out of it. Instead, we need to think about those outcomes, those jobs to be done and how we're helping people get things done. And that means having our technical staff working with product owners and others, domain experts, subject matter experts, to fully understand the scope of the problem and to design the API to address that first and then deliver the code as a result of that. 
So that, that, that's where I like teams to start with. And, and so in the book, I detail, you know, a couple of steps where you can have those kinds of collaborative sessions where you define things called job stories that are sort of like user stories, but they're more outcome focused and feature focused. And then breaking those job stories into activities and steps. So we sort of see the workflows and the and the, and the step-by-step processes that our APIs need to support. So that is a collaborative effort. We can't just do that on our own. Um, I like to remind developers particularly, because uh, I've been a developer myself and I've made the same mistake. Every line of code that you write or every function or method that you write and that you write automated tests for and that you're now supporting has a series of assumptions built in. So the sooner we can surface to make sure that those assumptions are reality and they're true and that we haven't misunderstood something or we're not missing an opportunity for something better or greater, uh, the better. So spending a little time collaborating up front will make all the difference in your APIs and your API design. Absolutely. And, and I, think, I think the other thing also to, to note here is that the API design is not a one, one-off thing. You're not just you know, designing or you know, thinking about API design at the beginning and you've, once you're in production, that is the end of it. I think that it is an evolving process. And I think you do touch upon um, how you can start thinking about this from with, with your sort of a model sort of framework that you sort of came up with, which is mm-hmm. ADDR. So maybe do you want to perhaps share that with the people? I think that might be quite, quite valuable for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. So ADDR stands for Align, Define, Design, Refine. Those are the four major phases that we go through anytime we're designing an API. And as you said, we don't have to do all of this up front. We might spend a little time doing aligning where we're doing that collaborative uh, you know, effort where we're designing our APIs together with, with business or subject matter experts or domain uh, experts, product owners, and so on together. That's the align phase. We want to spend time making sure we're building the right thing. And out of that might come a fairly large scoped idea. It's that it's kind of where that idea of product ownership and design thinking meets the idea of really preparing yourself to deliver an API into production. And it's that gap there that sometimes people have the hardest time starting with, which is why we end up just sitting down and starting to write a lot of code. Uh, and so writing a lot of code up front is not that bad, especially if we're trying to de-risk something, figure out, can we make this happen? Is there an unknown that we need to, 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 to surface or a risk we need to mitigate? There's, there's value in doing that. But if we, if, we does, if we just purely write code and don't have that collaborative session, then, then we might get ourselves in trouble because too many assumptions are baked in and it's going to cost us a lot of rework to get it done. So that's the align phase. Once we figured out what that scope is, then we go into the define phase. Define is where we start really breaking those details down and arriving at an API profile. This API profile is a definition of what your API is going to do, but it is not tied to a specific API style. So it's not saying we're going to use REST or GraphQL or gRPC or or anything else. What it's really doing is saying this is what the API needs to deliver, and it all ties back to those job stories in the align phase. What are those outcomes? What are we trying to deliver? How are we trying to solve people's problems and give them the ability to, to, to perform the jobs to be done so that they can get to those outcomes? So that's the fine phase, and that gives us a sketch or a model of our API. We then have the design phase. That's where we're starting to pick the API design styles. And we might decide that uh, you know, we, we need uh, REST as a, a foundational API because most of the people that are going to be integrating with us are more comfortable with REST. But we may also decide that we want to integrate some GraphQL. So maybe we decide all of our um, mutation operations, our creates, our updates, our deletes, all the kind of transactional in, in, interactions, maybe we'll do that in REST, but we'll also offer a GraphQL query operation to allow us to have this more robust standards-based way of querying data in a more ad hoc fashion, or to be able to response shape what comes back to meet, uh, you know, ISIS where we just, you know, a little bit of data. We don't want to send a lot of stuff across and risk, you know, network outages or delays and things. So we just want to get a, a few bits of data uh, to support what we need. So that's the design phase. And then refine is to go back around and start to surface that out, taking some of the design elements that we've had, mocking up our API, showing what it's going to be like to use it, putting that in front of those people that we talked with originally and saying, does this meet your need? Is this what you need? Have we hit the mark? Have we missed the mark? Do we need to make some improvements? And we can do that iteratively through that ADDR process over and over again. So you might spend a little more time during the align phase, understanding the breadth of the scope. You may then narrow that down, start 
defining, designing, and refining slices of it iteratively so that you are able to incorporate feedback, make adjustments as you go, as you learn new things, but in a way that recognizes that once the API is in production and someone's using it, it's forever. It's very difficult to make a breaking change without inconveniencing yourself and every one of your consumers. So we want to kind of balance that out because it's not just about us. It's not just about our own systems. We can't one day decide that we're going to change uh, the API like we might swap out a helper library and refactor some code and update our tests to pass again. We have to really keep in mind that the people are now integrated with us and they have expectations. Every day when they wake up, they expect things to still continue the way they were. And they shouldn't have to you know, run a fire drill that requires them to quickly fix code because something has changed, which... I've seen some API providers do, yep. and uh, and it's very <laughs> painful. So it, it balances that out. So we have a great developer experience. We have an opportunity to think a bit up front, to align, make sure we're we're headed in the right direction. We're going to produce the desired outcomes. We're delivering that value that we're promising, and uh, and also can do it in an iterative and, and agile fashion. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I I think just just to go back to the point around alignment, I think you you mentioned around. Probably writing a bit of code up front or maybe a little bit more code up front could potentially de risk it because you're you're looking at concepts. And maybe the way you think about it is proof of concepts. Um, you're essentially mm-hmm. you have an hypo- you have a hypothesis around you know what you intend things to do. You maybe you're sure, maybe you're not sure at that point of time. And I think that's kind of the objective there to, to you know, writing that much code up front is um, is it possible or not? I think the question to answer there is just a proof of concept, get that up. It's not production ready yet. And then based on that proof of concept, you can then start thinking about the remaining three phases and how that sort of integrates into that. Like now that we know that GraphQL, for instance, like you gave an example there, that can GraphQL handle something like, you know, federated subscriptions uh, efficiently? Or, you know, is there a different way of handling it? Do I want federation for myself or do I stick to something like schema stitching perhaps? You know, some of these decisions might need you to explore further and depending on that, you know, you can then make further decisions down the line around your design and refine phases as well, perhaps. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've, I've seen some organizations use that. They, they may have some things already identified and they want to de-risk it that way. They may go through the align and maybe even the define phase. And then they start to see, oh, we have some opportunities, like you said, for subscriptions and GraphQL, live subscriptions or something. And they say, oh, I wonder what this would look like. And then maybe there's a mainframe involved. I still work with clients that have mainframes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as much as they want to get rid of them, they they can't. And so, you know, can we make all of those things work? So you do a quick proof of concept, you either do it in the target programming language you're going to end up delivering in, and maybe it becomes an evolutionary prototype uh, right. or proof of concept where you can leverage some of that code and you can move it forward. It's not production ready when you write the, yep. the little proof of concept, but you can build on it or use it or start over again, or you can use a programming language you would never put in production, but it allows you to leverage something really quick, test something out. You prove that you can do it, and then you go and you use your, you know, your more production-ready environments that you've already been used to and have, have used. So there's all kinds of different ways to do it. You may find it all along the way where you just say, "Let's stop for a second. And let's figure out is this even doable before we make too many assumptions and 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 then get caught where we have to backtrack a bit." So there's a lot of value in that for sure. And and you're absolutely right around. You know, it it is an iterative process where ultimately I think we we do while we do have hypothesis, a lot of that is still there might be biases that come through because we are too close to products. And when we are building it, you know, we may have this set kind of thinking. So until the actual users test things out, we would never know how that actually works in the wild. We may, we may have a, like a theory and maybe we will be proven right. But in most cases, we won't know all of that till people have actually tried it out. And based on that, then we have to think about, okay, what would the next step be? Whether, you know, things are, are they working the way they were intended to be? Are they actually meeting the outcomes that they had initially intended to um, meet? Or do we need to go for a different strategy? And I think that's where you need to have agility in thinking. You need to think about not just building this one-off, one-and-done API development project, which I think a lot of organizations think about that from digital transformation journeys of, okay, I'm going to go for a two-year project of digital transformation. And by then, technology, half of it is is already old technology now. And, you know, your requirements might have already changed by then. So so I think that's the sort of that flexibility of thinking, agility of thinking is, is very important, I feel, when it comes to API design or strategizing around it. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to the next part um, is, again, on the note of flexibility and agility and how do you... Um, 
sort of sort of promote that, encourage that in organization. I think one of one of the ways where we sort of see ourselves as well from an API management perspective is that particular space that how do we ensure and provide people with that you know level of flexibility, whether that is a choice of API styles, whether that is a choice of architectures and how they are moving, transitioning from one one to the other, or even like you say, you know, breaking changes around versioning and how could you potentially help with that as well? So what do you see in terms of the role of API management platforms or API gateways? Um, how do you see them contributing towards this grand scheme of you know, API design or your API strategy of an organization? How would you say something like an API management product sort of helps it along or encourages it or it enables that, that aspect? Yeah, a great API management uh, layer or, or gateway is is really uh, essential because what a lot of what I see, particularly in larger organizations, is that they have services scattered all over. They have different areas of the business, different operating business units. Each of those business units or teams, depending on how they're structured, will have APIs that deliver value. But each API in and of itself is oftentimes not a product. So the API gateway or the, the management layer, like a Tyke, um, can help us to bundle our APIs. So we can take these smaller portions of APIs and bundle them into a cohesive product. And then we can set up a portal that talks about how all of these operations are there to deliver the needs of a particular set of personas, a particular market segment, or you know, however you're having to look at your industry and, and how you deliver and support it. So the, 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 a great API gateway allows us to be able to stand up new products under you know, a, a particular URL, assign some, some authorization schemes to it. You know, how are we going to support generating tokens and, and protect this API? And what are the, the scopes and the permissions and so on? And they can route back to those same backend APIs without having to write any more code. The gateway becomes not only a proxy, but a way to design that facade, that product facade to bundle and package things together. And then it's routing back to the backend systems as needed. And it provides that peace of mind for security, that ability to bundle, and it makes a huge difference. So if you're just a software as a service, you have one product and you're building an API over it, that may not be necessary. But as you, um, as either your SaaS product grows or you have a larger enterprise organization that's undergoing some digital transformation efforts. The bundling is absolutely essential because I, as a consumer, don't want to have to understand how your business is configured, how many business units you have, and why you have one operation over here under this umbrella and another operation over another, you know, in another part. And I have to do all the cognitive work to, and the searching and the research and all that to figure out how to put things together. It's the job of the API provider to bundle APIs to meet the needs of their marketplace. And so you need to have the infrastructure capable of handling that. And that's where the API management layer is absolutely essential piece to that whole equation. Absolutely. And I think, I think you mentioned another point around, you know, different organizations look at things a little bit differently where you may have a full-blown API management product like Tyke, which essentially could handle pretty much everything within the product itself, whether you're talking about API security or analytics or, you know, monitoring or versioning or plugins for customization, any of that essentially can be done handled with Tyke itself. But at the same time, we've also come across, you know, organizations where there are best in class or they might already have invested some money or, you know, invested resources in building out their existing stack. They may already have identity providers that take care of security. They may already have observability platforms which are handling their business intelligence and all of that and that's where so that's where essentially bringing all of this together um, all of your apis together so that they are then exposed not just for external consumption but also to fit in very nicely with these um, external systems who are targeted tasks to do or specific things they're delegated to perform very specific things whether that is security or observability and like you say, the, the API gateway, API management platform sort of ties it all together very nicely so that, you know, as an API provider, I'm getting the peace of mind that, you know, if security is a big concern for me, which usually is for everybody, I'm, I'm not sure anybody's going to say security is not a concern for me. So security is definitely a concern for people. It's essentially how, how to manage the evolving needs and evolving nature of security as well, because there are newer threats that are being detected. There might be newer standards that are becoming coming in. Watch 
I think a lot of people need to avoid perhaps is if you're baking a lot of that stuff into your microservices or your, your code base, then a lot of that then needs to be changed as well. Uh, each component potentially will have to then be handled separately uh, when newer standards need to be adopted. Whereas with an abstracted layer here, you can sort of handle that a little bit easily where, you know, it's essentially at the gateway layer, if you're handling the security, and that sort of forms the umbrella as a standard method for all the services that are underlying it. So I think that's where a lot of that efficiency flexibility sort of comes in with this particular layer. And um, it, it fits into, again, like you say, providing that value to end users? How do you make it easy for people to consume? How do you make it easy for people to, to drive that jobs to be done that they are more concerned about than the, the logistics of how it's already happening? So, yeah. um, okay, um, moving on, I think we have about 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna go into one more big question and then depending on if other questions coming in, we can, we can take things forward. Um, you mentioned this right up front around the principles of API design when we are talking about that you mentioned around developer experience, and I think this has come up a few times where um, there've been questions around what is developer experience? Is it just UX for DX, uh, UX for developers? Is it more than that? How do you think about developer experience? What does that actually mean? Um, and if we have time for, to go into it, how do you actually do it well? Or, or if you've got examples of organizations that you've seen doing it very well, then I think that would be a good starting one. So what is developer experience to, in, in your opinion? Yeah, for me, developer experience is really um, thinking about the user interface for a developer that's going to have to work with the API. That's first and foremost what it is. When we think about all the other elements, they tend to, to go over to the product experience side of things. But, but I think from developer experience specifically, can I understand your API without a lot of cognitive load? Am I going to have to spend days and days wrestling, trying to make this API do something I want it to do? Or can I sit down uh, during my lunch, after hours, or just part of my daily work that I'm tasked with doing, sitting down and understanding how to use an API? So um, I, I think when we're a developer writing or you know implementing and delivering an API, um, it, it's oftentimes we think of it almost like we're writing a, a library that we're going to use ourselves. And from that perspective, the, the library that we use ourselves, we can look at the code and we can look at our comments. If we put comments in it and all developers should be doing that. <laughs> uh, I know that there's people that say that to the contrary, but I can guarantee you that you in three months later will not remember why you did something a specific way. So just Noting those kinds of things are important for, for good maintenance and understanding of, for your own sake, for the code that you've written. But to keep in mind that people using your API, they will not have access to your source code. And even if they do, because your API is open source, you just happen to have one of those, you know, uh, an open source product or something that, that offers the code, source code. No one wants to go look at your code and try to figure out what's going on. I shouldn't have to go look at JavaScript source for some reference application to understand how to call your, your API. I shouldn't have to be digging around and debugging and stepping through to understand how to use it. Uh, that means um, one, making sure that you're consistent so that when I use one operation from your API and I use another one, that I don't have to handle errors differently, that your error handling is consistent, that your naming conventions are consistent, that when I write some code, I can, re I can leverage that again for common structures that are used across your, your API and you're not changing things up every time because you designed one three months ago and one three weeks ago and you've decided to, to make some changes and now there's a bunch of ins inconsistencies. It means thinking about documentation. Have I documented each operation successfully either using GraphQL's uh, schema definition language maybe putting up the, the GraphQL playground with some examples that are well-documented to show people how to compose queries and use mutations and so on and so forth. Uh, have I documented my REST API using open API spec or, or API blueprint or one of the other standards that are out there for, for capturing documentation and such. But even beyond that, what are the common tasks that most developers need to have? What, you know, is there a getting started guide or a series of cookbooks that, you know, how to guides to, to show how to do common things and to put those things together. So a reference documentation is great because it tells me how to use each operation, but it doesn't tell me how to use the operations together and orchestrate them to get a job done. So it all again goes back to that align phase, the jobs to be done, the outcomes, and then how you would use those operations and combine them to produce those outcomes. So it's, 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 a, 
it's a series of, of steps and, and thought processes and, and activities that require us to think about that developer that maybe is a, as a contractor, they don't work for your organization. They really don't understand commercial insurance or banking or, you know, airline industry. They've just been brought in to build up a, a web app or a mobile app, and they need to understand how to use the API. And so you need to be thoughtful about, does my documentation help someone who's new to the industry? They just graduated university and now they're on their first job and they really don't understand these terms. Does the API help them understand it? Or does it make assumptions about knowledge, assumptions about certain behaviors and processes that they may not be familiar with? It's taking all those things into consideration so that the developer can implement the API and can go to their manager, go to their team, go to their friends, go to their colleagues and say, this API was wonderful. They know what they're doing. They showed me how to do it. I was able to get this integrated in just a few hours. I've written some tests around it. Everything's all good. And I can move on to the next thing that I need to do, or I can continue to add value by adding new features, capabilities, or you know, incorporate new jobs to be done, whatever that is. And then we can elevate that a bit further with product experience. So does the API documentation help non-technical people understand what the API does? The decision makers, the people that are making decisions on budget, um, do they understand what the API does? Do they see what the value is from a business perspective? Can they uh, um, represent you at the table to say, yeah, they, they've done a great job of documenting the API. It's very clear that they're going to solve the problems we have, and we're willing to put out, lay down a budget, a yearly budget for the next five years to use this API, and we see this as a valuable relationship business to business that we want to have. So there's there's a there's layers that you can go up with on that, but but at, at its basic core, it's helping those developers have that third interface that they need, the documentation, everything they need to be successful integrating the API, being a consumer pro. Right, uh, that's really good. I think I think just thinking from an organization's perspective, because you mentioned a couple of things around you know things like conventions and you know the decisions that you're making. A big part of that obviously comes in, you know, your, the API governance side of things of your organization. Like, you know, the, you're thinking about how do you go about maintaining, this is obviously not specific to developer experience, but it's essentially how you would be going about maintaining everything around your APIs on an ongoing basis. How do you set up those standards? What are the conventions that are required around that? Your versioning strategy, retirement strategy, all of that. So I'm quite curious in terms of, uh, in terms of, what tools could potentially people use to essentially, you know, help that in an organization? Because what you don't want to have is obviously if you've worked on this API governance document, perhaps, and it, it's and at the end of the day, it's a document that then we don't want that to be, you know, sitting there somewhere and then people trying to find a link to it at some point and like, oh, having a reference. But how do you make sure that, you know, that's not what's happening with a, either the API strategy, which is obviously evolving, as well as the API governance document that is also evolving over time, which should be referenced more. So how do you, how do you sort of uh, help with that? Uh, yeah, so I, I work with a lot of organizations to help them with that. And they may have already established a style guide or maybe using one off the shelf. Uh, a recent client has uh, had selected the Microsoft API style guide just because that seemed to fit what they were doing the best. Um, but I also encourage them once I started working with them to take that style guide, bring it in house, you know, fork the style guide and make it their own because that style guide in particular reflects what Microsoft is trying to do. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's also very opinionated about certain aspects that, you know, Microsoft has, has been pushing the OData standard for quite some time. And I actually mentioned yep. OData as well as GraphQL and gRPC in the book yep. so that people can see that you can use the, the process with different API styles. And, and Microsoft comes from the investment of OData and Microsoft Graph and the things that they've done. And so their style guide is sort of tailored to that. And if that's not what you're doing, the naming convention, certain things so that you have consistency in your design across teams is really, uh, you know, will come through. But then there'll be a lot of opinions in there that your organization may say, we don't need that or we prefer something else. So I would recommend don't reinvent the wheel. Start from a style guide that already exists and, and then use that to fork and customize and make it your own and then use that to drive consistency. And I've seen tools like Spectral, which is a linter that you can apply to any JSON or YAML. Um, and so you can use that to drive consistency of naming conventions and 
you can get pretty sophisticated writing rules. Like, oh, if this is a, a 204 response code for a REST API, it should not have a payload. And if it does, then we're actually violating the HTTP specification. So we need to flag that. And then that team needs to reevaluate that and go, well, is it really a 204? And I'm not going to send back something. Is it more of a 200 okay? And I'm going to send back something or, you know, whatever those kinds of things are. So that one, we're following the HTTP standards so that we're not breaking industry standards and approaches and recommendations and RFCs. And two, that we're consistent and doing what other developers would expect us to do in those cases. So linters are great. Using, uh, I've seen API design management tools like Swagger Hub, Stoplight, or the open source tool Backstage. Um, right. Those kinds of tools are great for having a catalog of APIs and integrating it with your CI CD along with linters and things to manage the lifecycle and drive consistency. So there's tooling you can put in there. Um, it's using these specification standards like Open API Spec and SDLs and, and the right. IDLs for gRPC and and, and capturing those and versioning them in, in Git repos or something so that they're versioned and you can track changes and, and so on and so forth. All of those tools all add up to having uh, a series of governance and standards and practices, design patterns, recommendations that produce consistency. In some organizations, I see it manifested as a center of excellence, COE, or a, uh, a center for enablement, C4E, or an API guild. Or, or, you know, a group that really have a passion for APIs, take ownership and want to have a passion for that developer experience like we talked about. So they implement lightweight governance. We're not talking about for those that have been around during the, the service-oriented architecture, SOA days with those heavy, the heavy, yeah. heavyweight governance and all kinds of, of crazy standards and specifications. We're not talking about that level. We're talking about lightweight governance that encourages consistency and makes decisions for teams easy uh, so that they don't have to, every team's not forced to make a decision about, well, what are our naming standards going to be? How are we going to compose, um, you know, different different uh, URL paths and, and things like that. So there's there's a lot of value in, in standing up some lightweight governance, having a, a centralized group or a federated group of ownership that stewards that, and then introducing the, the tools to support that lifecycle all throughout the process. So that's, that's what we see when it comes to government. One question that I do have to sort of bookend this session, I feel, because there's, there's always this little, um, how do you say, there is this balance that you need to maintain between, you know, the thing that is every day when it comes to the world of APIs, you know, the day-to-day -day business as usual with your APIs, you don't want breaking changes. You don't want things to, you know, you want things to be running as it is. You want things to be boring, not overly exciting where you're fighting fires. But at the same time, there, there comes times where you have technologies that come in that really excite you, where you know, you're know you thinking, oh, this is the next big thing, or this can really solve this particular problem in a much more elegant, performant way, perhaps, than it's ever been done before. So out of curiosity, is there, is there something like this that you have in mind at the moment, which has really excited you over maybe the last year or so, or maybe something that is, that is still in the pipeline, um, something that excited you in the world of APIs recently? Uh, I, I think for me, what's really been exciting has been two things. One is not a specific tool or, or innovation as much as just seeing this mind shift toward, uh, you know, treating APIs as first class citizens, seeing more and more organizations doing that, and really seeing the value in doing that. Um, and that's really good. The, the second thing that I would say, and I've written about this before, so it's not necessarily in the last year, but in the last few years, we've seen a real huge growth and excitement in event-driven and asynchronous APIs. And I think there's a huge value in that, that being able to not just have to call an API and pull it and watch and, and try to see, can I get representations back from the API that helps me understand as a consumer that something has changed, but rather give me a notification, whether it's over WebSockets, whether it's GraphQL Live subscriptions, whether it's webhooks, whether it's uh, server sent events, which I know browsers are not supporting, but are really valuable for server to server communication, they're really lightweight, and very restful and easy to implement. Um, you know, all of those things are really powerful and just an uptick in interest in event driven architecture and reactive architecture on the back end. That doesn't necessarily always result in surfacing async APIs out 
toward the world, but just to be able to build things that are more resilient with the, with eventing. Uh, I was into introduced to eventing myself back in around 99 or so. That was my first exposure. I know I've been around longer, but I, I kind of got a taste for it and went, wow, this is really popular. Why aren't we doing this more? And, uh, and, and then we saw a huge surge in it with SOA and then it kind of backed off again. And so now we're coming back again and, and seeing this tool in our tool belt. And now we're seeing, you know, Tyke and other vendors starting to really embrace it and say, how can we help people support async APIs? So just, just as a, the gratuitous plug, once more, the book, uh, the ADDR process that we cover in the book, we actually have a chapter. Uh, I put a chapter in there on the async API and, and how do you do that? So in the beginning, we identify events and, and then we can build our synchronous and asynchronous APIs throughout using the same ADDR process. And it helps us to spot that. And it talks about all these different styles I mentioned. So if some of these are new to you, uh, you can check it out in the book. We give a, a brief summary of each one and what you would use them for and when they're valuable. There's a lot of value in async APIs to allow people to extend things. Uh, I know we're short on time, but one final thought to keep people in mind. We would not have software as a service, CI, CD tooling, if GitHub had not put in a webhook for when you commit code to a Git repo. Git has the ability to event and have a script, but they turn that into an HTTP webhook. And we have an entire marketplace of solutions that previously had to be installed inside of our own environments that now can be outsourced uh, for, for just, you know, a few dollars or tens of dollars a month for, for a small project to have a private repo that kicks off a CI CD process all because of a webhook. It's an asynchronous API. So there is a huge amount of value in it. And I think there's a lot of opportunity that's untapped right now. So I'm really excited to see where this goes in the coming years. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye and take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of All About APIs, powered by Tyke a leading cloud-native API management platform for the modern stack. So come, empower your teams and put your devs in the driver's seat. If you want to find out more, visit us at tyke.io. And until next time, take good care of yourself.